All right. We're talking with Rich Dolan of New Era, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of Grand Valley State University. Uh, Mr. Dolan, why don't you start by filling in a little bit of background and where you were born and grew up. Okay. I was born uh, July 16th, 1948 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was the oldest of uh, three in the family. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran and uh, was in the heating and air conditioning business all of his life. My mom was stay at home. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandpa had been a World War I veteran, so there was uh, some history there in the family. Um, childhood, probably quite normal. Uh, middle class, South Minneapolis, mm -hmm. um, lots of friends, lots of outdoor activities and different things. Uh, so nothing particularly special about that. Uh, normal childhood growing up, graduated from high school, headed off to college, and after two years just kind of decided that the direction I was heading wasn't the one I wanted to go. Where were you going uh, to college at the time? Um, I did a year at uh, the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, was there kind of on a financial aid for track, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't like the size, mostly. It was mm -hmm. so huge and impersonal. <laughs> um, so I went to a small Bible college in Grand Rapids for a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I was doing, I just kind of felt, you know, this isn't the direction I want. I wanted to take a little bit of time off and just kind of reevaluate. And during that time, I got married uh, November 1st of 1968. And of course, at that point in time, if you weren't in school, mm -hmm. uh, your draft board got interested in you, which they did. And I had had an interest in the career of air traffic control. Uh, actually, I wrote a paper on it in junior high school mm -hmm. as you know, a career option and thought um, I'd like to give it a try uh, and doing so in the Army was a good way because I only had three years of it. If I didn't like it, I was done with it. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to enlist for a specific MOS and uh, test it out for that and uh, that's what I ended up doing in the, in the military. Okay. Um, so you, did you basically go and enlist then before you got any kind of draft notice or your I knew my or... number was up. Okay. <laughs> that I was probably going to be getting a notice within the next month or two, so to circumvent that, I went and enlisted. Okay. Now, at that point, how was the uh, Army kind of promoting enlistment and, and recruitment? Can you describe what it was they were offering you? And, uh... They were offering me three years with a guaranteed MOS. Uh, my training was What guaranteed. is an MOS? MOS is your military occupational specialty. Okay. That's the job you had in the Army. Right. The guarantee at that point, you did not get any kind of enlistment bonus or anything like mm -hmm. that. Instead of being drafted for two years, you enlisted for three. Mm -hmm. um, you were tested out ahead of time and guaranteed training. Mm -hmm. You were not guaranteed that that's the job you would do once you were out of training. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was guaranteed that I would be trained as air traffic control unless I washed out, which mm -hmm. the rates were fairly high. And then it was up to the Army where they wanted to put me. Okay. Um, and, and so that was the only guarantee I went in with. Okay. So describe the process of, of, of kind of going in uh, into the Army and going through examination and training okay. and so forth. Um, went through a normal enlistment process, went in, sat down, um, discussed with the um, recruiter uh, what some of the options were. Um, then at that point they actually tested us out and air traffic mm -hmm. control was one of them where the, you had to have very high test scores. It's mm -hmm. one of the highest rated uh, in the military. It was at kind of a funny point because Army air traffic controllers had always been trained by the Air Force, mm -hmm. but just as I was going in, the Army was starting their own school, and I actually ended up being one of the first classes to go through the Army training for air traffic okay. control. Did the Army at this point have its own did it, airplanes or just helicopters, or they had... They had their own um, at that point. Army aviation was growing, mm -hmm. and this was a point in history where the concept of air mobile troops mm -hmm. um, was conceptualized right. but hadn't really been put into practice. And so I think the Army at this point was looking at an expansion of that and trying to see how it worked. And so they were transferring a lot of the stuff from the Air Force over to their own uh, because it was a little more specialized with some different operations mm -hmm. than the Air Force was necessarily doing. And uh, so they were just starting that school. But um, I went through the testing and qualified that way mm -hmm. for air traffic control. Then I had to go actually over to the Air Force Base in Detroit 
and uh, take my physicals. Mm -hmm. um, you had to have a, a flight physical, special eye exams, a whole bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, pass all of those prior to my enlistment to make sure that, that I could get into that school. Now, for a flight physical, does that mean just be healthy enough to be in an airplane? Because for a controller, you wouldn't be a pilot. <laughs> you don't have to be a pilot, but even in the civilian sector, you have mm -hmm. to pass what's called a Class II uh, flight physical. There's mm -hmm. actually three classes of them. Um, as a private pilot, I only have to have a third class. As a commercial pilot, you have to have a first. Mm -hmm. In between, there's another one that fits with uh, some uh, pilots that aren't commercial but are flying, for instance, uh, for... Um, companies that own their own planes mm -hmm. and so forth that are doing a lot of IFR or smaller commuters and for air traffic controllers you have to have a class two so it's mm -hmm. a fairly high level physical mm -hmm. with a lot of eye hearing mm -hmm. and so forth um, and had to have that the whole time I was in the Army and through my civilian career in air traffic okay so they test you out in Detroit and what do you do next uh, just waited for the results, and then, of course, in uh, August of 1969, I was inducted. Mm -hmm. So I was taken back down at, in the Detroit area, uh, given the final physicals, which, mm -hmm. you know, you always hear about the 20 guys in a room. Yeah. Um, that was kind of the last straw, loaded on a bus and taken down to Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. uh, got there late in the evening, and, of course, were greeted by the DIs and uh, the drill instructors. Mm -hmm. At uh, that time... Um, they still kind of used a lot of harassment and intimidation, I think. I mean, they came on the bus and started screaming at you, calling you names, mm -hmm. and, you know, giving you 15 seconds to get all 100 guys off of the bus and lined up out front. Mm -hmm. um, then I noticed kind of a lot of walking around in little group meetings. It seemed to me they were evaluating people, <laughs> um, you know, in your first little get-together. This one's good, this one isn't. Keep an eye on that one seemed to be going on. And uh, we were taken into a barracks that was kind of for your first night and mm -hmm. went to bed. Um, next morning, of course, we got up, turned in our civilian clothes, got uniforms, got our heads shaved. Um, we're actually um, assigned to our companies for basic training. Okay. At this point, are the people you're in there with uh, heading to a bunch of different specializations or do they, so they don't have your group yes, together? Yes, they've got, um, they do have people from all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't just my group from Michigan. We were divided up. Mm -hmm. So I had guys from Michigan in my uh, basic training outfit, but also guys from Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, um, all over the place, and they were going in every direction. Some right. of them knew what they were going to be doing at that point. A mm -hmm. lot of them didn't. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate in a way. I was placed in kind of an experimental basic training company. Mm -hmm. um, everybody in there had two or more years of college, mm -hmm. so we were a little bit older, most of us at least into our 20s mm -hmm. rather than being 17, 18, 19 year olds. Um, we did a lot more classroom stuff and a lot less physical. Um, mm -hmm. We still had to pass all the physical right. training and so forth, but um, it was a little bit different um, going through basic than what a lot of people experience because of that. In fact, I got leave a couple of weekends, and uh, when I was home in the Detroit area one weekend, I happened to call my dad. He about went crazy because he, <laughs> he assumed I had gone over the wire. <laughs> it, it took me a long time to convince him they actually had given me leave, and it was okay for me to be home that weekend. Um, because of when he went through basic, you never got anything like that. Did you have any indication of whether the guys doing the regular training were getting the same opportunities? I mean, was the Army kind of now being a little bit nicer? They weren't nice, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the experimentation uh, was to see if we have these people that have done some college, mm -hmm. perhaps slightly more motivated. Mm -hmm. I think we may have had more that enlisted than were drafted, mm -hmm. um, if you could handle them a little differently. But I didn't see where we were treated any more <laughs> than the other people. Um, you know, we still had the, the hundreds of push-ups, mm -hmm. um, scrubbing bathroom floors with a toothbrush, dry shaving in the morning if they found a whisker out of mm -hmm. place. Um, all of the inspections, we still had all of that. Um, what we didn't have was as much of the physical training. Mm -hmm. We still did a lot of marching, um, close order drill, mm -hmm. um, but we did have more classroom. One of them I remember is when they came and got a bunch of us from the company and took us in to a special meeting. And uh, a captain, as I recall, got up there and talked to us for about an hour. And they, we need guys of your caliber and all this, mm -hmm. that, and the other thing. Well, was signing up for explosive ordnance demolition <laughs> and <they laughs> trying to get us to volunteer for that. I think 100% of us were smart enough to say no that particular day, and we walked out. 
but uh, it was just interesting that we got hit pretty heavy with some of those types mm -hmm. of things. Okay, so how long does the basic training go on? Basic training at that point was eight weeks, mm -hmm. and um, at the end of it, of course, we had to pass our physical training test. We had uh, written uh, tests that had to be taken, and we got our orders uh, for training. And from there, I was actually sent down to Mississippi to the Air Force Base mm -hmm. because the Army was just phasing out. And some of the people that went in earlier than I did had not had their physicals. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted qualified people down there to fill up the last couple of classes if mm -hmm. any of these people washed out on their physical. So I was down there for about two weeks at Biloxi, Mississippi, mm -hmm. um, shortly after a hurricane, by the way, which made it extra interesting. Um, and then from there I was shipped up to Fort Rucker, Alabama, which is where um, the home of Army Aviation was, mm -hmm. and that's where our school was started. Um, we arrived there, we were taken to the company area and uh, hauled over to our barracks. We had to take the condemned signs off of the doors in order okay. to open up of our, our barracks to move in. They were old World War II barracks, mm -hmm. way on the back side of uh, the post down there. They had coal furnaces, which meant some of us didn't get Christmas off. Mm -hmm. uh, made them unique for living because the upstairs, they were two-story. The upstairs was so hot you could hardly breathe, mm -hmm. and on the lower floor the butt cans would freeze at night. It was so cold. So uh, very inefficient, <laughs> old places. Uh, but we did have a brand new program, some excellent labs, and uh, civilian instructors on the air traffic control field. And uh, I felt an excellent school. Did mm -hmm. a really great job. Uh, when we came out of there, we knew our stuff. And, um, of course, with all of the uh, training down there of the pilots as well, mm -hmm. we had a lot of satellite bases that we went out to for our hands-on training after the classroom and gave us some um, very, very good experience uh, before being shipped out. So you were actually getting to go out and, and be doing the work that you do as a controller so you could track the planes on the radar and stuff like exactly, that? Exactly, yes. Uh, pause right here. Hello? Okay, so what sort of hands-on training or stuff that you might actually use were you getting? Well, actually, I was trained. To, there were actually three um, separate parts of Army Air Traffic Control. Mm -hmm. There was the Air Traffic Control Tower, which is what most people are familiar with. Right. You see them at airports all over the country. There was also what's called an en route portion, which uh, was basically between airports controlling airplanes. Then there's ground controlled approach, which mm -hmm. is what I was trained in. Um, the GCA portion is actually a type of radar that when it's in the search mode looks mm -hmm. like normal radar, mm -hmm. but when you put it into the mode for taking an aircraft on an approach, the antenna that normally sweeps simply mm -hmm. goes back and forth, mm -hmm. and then there's a second antenna next to it that just goes up and down, and they just wiggle like that. What it does is on the radar scope, it puts two lines, mm -hmm. two cursors. One of them is the extended runway center line, mm -hmm. and the other is a glide path. Mm -hmm. So it's going at a preset angle out from the airport up basically to infinity. And so the purpose of GCA is to, by using heading and um, varying the rate of descent, mm -hmm. getting an aircraft centered on the course line mm -hmm. and the glide path, and you can bring them right down to the end of the runway and into a safe landing. It is, of course, mostly used when the weather's bad mm -hmm. and uh, they're not able to see the airport. So in GCA, we had, first of all, um, as I recall, about eight weeks of classroom training. Um, and we had to pass the FAA written exams mm -hmm. for government air traffic controllers. Right. Um, then we had about two weeks of lab. Um, where we were in a simulated radar environment. Mm -hmm. There was somebody behind a wall putting yeah. inputs into what then were very huge computers, mm -hmm. and that all came up, and so they followed our instructions and made it happen on our radar scopes. Um, once we had passed that, then we were sent out to the airfields all around uh, Fort Rucker area mm -hmm. where the um, pilots in training would go out and do their exercises. So we would be in a small radar building there, mm -hmm. actually doing the GCA approaches for student pilots. So both of us were learning the process. Okay. And uh, we yeah. went through that for, uh, as I recall, about six weeks. Now, were there uh, accidents or near misses while you were doing that? Um, no, there weren't. Um, <laughs> the students were basically only trained on VFR days, which means good weather. Mm -hmm. um, you can be out there and be seen. Um, and there were just a few at a time. They would come mm -hmm. all throughout the day, 
but only a few at a time at each little airfield. So it wasn't any kind of congested activity right, at right. those. Yeah, so. uh, okay, so then what's your next stage of training then once you complete that work? Well, once we finished uh, the lab work, uh, we graduated mm -hmm. and uh, we were sent off on our assignments and uh, most of us were assigned uh, to Vietnam. So at that point I got uh, 30 days leave, mm -hmm. uh, then reported to Oakland, California and uh, flew over to uh, Vietnam. Landed at Benoit Air Force Base just outside of Saigon and uh, waited about two days to uh, get my orders uh, to Kuchi. Okay. Now when they're flying you at this point, are they flying you in, in military aircraft as opposed to civilian ones? We flew commercially. It was okay. a civilian aircraft and uh, we kind of did a hop from California to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, on ours over, we got in a holding pattern about 2 o'clock in the morning going into Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And we're scratching our heads, and the pilot's trying to convince us that it was traffic issues. <laughs> uh, no, we don't think so. What we found out later is one of the gear lights wasn't working, and they weren't sure if one of the landing gear was down. Uh, and uh, so when we got in, we had a bit of a layover there while they repaired that problem. <laughs> and then uh, flew on to Manila, and then from Manila over to Saigon. Okay. Um, what was your kind of impression or experience kind of getting off the plane in Saigon? Oh, man. Um, it was very early in the morning, as I recall, one or two o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, what I remember most is that as you step through the door from the airplane outside, the odor and the heat, okay. um, they both just kind of hit you like a hammer. It was uh, such a contrast from the air-conditioned comfort of the airplane into the hot, humid, miserable weather of Vietnam, uh, just mm -hmm. kind of in that one step mm -hmm. that just, it really struck you as, Wow. What sort of odor was there? Well, um, <laughs> the river that floats through Saigon, um, if you ever saw it from the air, was this dark, dark brown. Mm -hmm. um, there were piles of garbage that went down from the banks from the city to the mm -hmm. river, and a lot of the city's waste was simply dumped right in there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, plus the fact that on our bases out where we were, most of the human waste mm -hmm. was burned. Mm -hmm. um, the outhouses had split 55 gallon drums in them and every day a Papa son would come drag those out, fill them with diesel fuel and light them and uh, replace them with the barrels from the day before. So okay. on a base camp like Ku Chi, which was the home of the 25th Infantry Division, so it was a fairly large mm -hmm. camp, um, there was a lot of that going on and uh, throughout the entire country mm -hmm. and so there was always a certain odor in the air uh, that accompanied that. Okay, so you, you get off the plane with that particular greeting, and then, then what, what did you do next? Well, we went inside this huge building, um, I believe it was an old hangar, and uh, simply sat down and, and waited, which mm -hmm. of course the military is famous for. Um, all of our baggage was taken off the plane and kind of thrown in a corner, and after a while some officer came in and welcomed us to Vietnam and mm -hmm. told us to go find our stuff. Um, and because it was so early in the morning, we were again escorted to a, a barracks area that was mm -hmm. just for that night mm -hmm. um, and, and actually weren't processed into country until the next morning, uh, about 8 or 8.30 mm -hmm. in the morning. Um, still waited another day before we got orders, and at that point I was assigned to the 1st Aviation Brigade and then the 341st Aviation Detachment Divisional, which was out at Coochie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where, was, where is Coochie relative to Saigon? Kuchi was about uh, 50 miles northwest of uh, Saigon, mm -hmm. um, right up the highway, uh, about midway between Saigon and uh, Tay Ninh, mm -hmm. um, which was very close to the Cambodian border. Okay. Um, do you remember anything about the trip up there? And how did you get there, first of all? I uh, just got there on a UH-1. Um, nothing spectacular, just kind of wondering what you were getting mm -hmm. into. Um, it was really a fairly short flight, as yeah. I recall, only about 20 minutes. Right. Um, by helicopter. Um, just kind of seeing the countryside for the first time mm -hmm. um, and what was out there. The area that I was in had been part of the Iron Triangle, uh, the Bolo Woods, um, mm -hmm. which during Tet was a very hot area. Mm -hmm. It had been pretty much defoliated by the time I got there, mm -hmm. so the countryside had changed uh, a lot. But you were seeing the rice paddies, the, the people out working mm -hmm. those, and just scattered little hamlets. Mm -hmm. um, totally different than, than what you see yeah, here yeah. when you fly from point A to point B. Uh, wasn't my first helicopter ride, uh, but it was the first one where I had a gunner on each side mm -hmm. behind me. 
um, and you know where you're actually concerned about what's happening on the ground. So it yeah. was kind of interesting from that standpoint. What have you been told about conditions in, in Vietnam or in this kind of assignment before you got there? I mean, was anyone telling you anything? Not really a whole lot. Um, we did have uh, some NCOs in the company down at Fort Rucker that had been in Vietnam. They didn't really talk a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. There was such a difference uh, between, say, I Corps and Three Corps, where mm -hmm. I was, going from mountainous uh, terrain up there mm -hmm. um, near the DMZ, which was, of course, a lot harder down to the area that I was in, in mm -hmm. the Three Corps area, mm -hmm. where it was mostly flat, um, a lot hotter, much wetter. Mm -hmm. um, and so it depended on where you were going. Mm -hmm. And so really, it didn't have a whole lot of information as far as what you were getting into. Mm -hmm. And what did you see when, when, when you got to Coochie? When I got out to Coochie, I saw a, a fairly good sized base camp, um, mm -hmm. looked fairly civilized. <laughs> of course, um, you flew in over the wire mm -hmm. with the guard towers all around. Um, the airport was fair sized, it, it had uh, just one runway, uh, but we had a myriad of heliports all around mm -hmm. the base camp, being the 25th Infantry Headquarters. <laughs> it was a very, very busy airfield. Um, I don't know how many people um, were on, but I know the commanding general of the 25th was there with his staff. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the 25th Infantry, the entire 25th Aviation mm -hmm. um, was on the base camp. So it was a large camp. Um, our particular company area was right on the berm. Um, we were just, it was us, a small road and, and mm -hmm. then the, the wire um, going mm -hmm. out into the wild country. Um, we were a unique company in that we had not only the air traffic controllers, but also the refuelers and the rearmament people, mm -hmm. which was a little bit unusual. So we had a wide variety of people. Most of the POL and rearm guys were kind of troublemakers that mm -hmm. other companies wanted to get rid of <laughs> and, and shuttled them over there. So we got along well and uh, worked well together, but there was quite a contrast on the two sides of the company area as far as the personnel were concerned. Um, the people I worked with, um, you know, great bunch of, of people. I enjoyed the time with them. Um, very professional in, uh, in how they did their jobs and um, just, uh, I think, did a conscientious job and an excellent job. So it, it, was a, it was a good place to be. I think from the standpoint of security, mm -hmm. although we did get mortar attacks, and, and of course now we know about the Coochie tunnels, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them actually came right under the base camp, and we used to wonder how some of them got on the camp uh, that would roam around at night and, and uh, cause trouble, um, but now we know some of that. Okay, let's just hold on there. That's a lot of risk of doing. Uh, let's uh, continue here by describing sort of what sort of typical things you had to do uh, in your job there. Okay. Um, Coochie was a very busy tactical airfield. It was one of the two busiest in country, and there's mm -hmm. some argument about which was the busiest. Um, we were 24 hour a day, seven days a week, so basically we got one day off every two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the, both the tower and the GCA were staffed 24 hours a day. Um, starting out, of course, it was a matter of learning about the area, mm -hmm. what surrounded the base camp, um, what kind of terrain you were dealing with, what kind of weather we had to deal with, um, and getting used to running the approaches into our airport with the different types of aircraft that we had around mm -hmm. there. Um, so that was probably just about a month-long um, training cycle before you were signed off to work on your own. Mm -hmm. um, I chose, after I was certified in GCA, to cross-train over to the tower mm -hmm. um, just to get that experience right. and um, to enjoy a little bit of diversity. So actually, um, after that, I, I worked both. I, I worked GCA far more, <clears throat> worked tower just enough to stay certified and right. uh, current working that. But uh, at Coochie, um, we averaged about 58,000 operations a month. Um, an operation is either a takeoff or a landing. Mm -hmm. As I said, we had the one runway, um, then we had the POL and rearm areas, and then helipads all over the base camp. So you could actually be running simultaneous operations, right. going or coming from different directions into different locations on the base camp. Mm -hmm. um, the GCA, all you could run them to is the runway because mm -hmm. that's where we were set up to get them. But from the tower I remember a lot of walking around and, and you just point. 
<laughs> you're there, you're going there. You're there, you're going there. You're there, you're going out that way. You're doing this. And as long as you didn't point two places in a row, you were okay. Um, and most everybody kind of worked that way because especially during daylight hours, it was mm -hmm. relatively hectic. Um, we did get up uh, during the Cambodian um, time when mm -hmm. we had uh, several additional helicopter companies on the base camp mm -hmm. uh, to around 80,000 operations a month. Uh, one of the things I brought up before was the professionalism. When you think, mm -hmm. I mean, these were 21, 22, 23 yeah. year old yeah. guys controlling 21, 22, 23 mm -hmm. year old pilots. And in the time the 341st was there, there was never an incident attributable to any of the guys uh, that were air traffic controllers. And I think that's a pretty good record for a bunch of young hotshots uh, doing a job like that. Yeah. How much of your business had to do, at least from the tower, had to do with controlling the helicopters? I mean, I sense there's a lot more of them than there are of... The vast majority of it on an Army base was helicopters. Um, we had companies with um, what they called the Loach, the OH-6 and OH-58, which were smaller observational helicopters. Mm -hmm. They weren't really gunships or attack helicopters. Um, of course, a lot of the UH-1 Huey, which is probably the helicopter most associated mm -hmm. with Vietnam, had loads of those as well as CH-47 Chinooks, which um, you still see around mm -hmm. today. They're the ones with the two big rotors, right. one in front and one in back. Um, we'd get a few sky cranes in there, the CH-54s. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any stationed there, but they would come in now and then. Uh, but the vast majority, I'd say probably 70 to 75 percent of our operations were helicopters. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did have um, a company of O-1 Bird Dogs, which was a small tandem two-seat aircraft mm -hmm. um, assigned there, as well as a company of Air Force OV-10s, which was a twin-engine observation aircraft. They generally went out and ran spotting for like F-4 mm -hmm. um, drops and things like that. Um, we got a lot of Army and Air Force C-7s, uh, C-123s and C-130s, which were larger cargo mm -hmm. aircraft. On occasion, just for grins, we'd get uh, some fighters that would come in and do low approaches mm -hmm. and stuff, and I did a few uh, GCAs with them. That generally upset the general, though, because they <laughs> like, like to hit their afterburners and make a loud noise when they went over, and most of the senior staff didn't like that too much, <laughs> so we tried to do a minimum of that. But it was a wide variety of aircraft uh, that we worked with, but the majority was helicopters. Were there... Uh any problems in sort of the air, the areas, the, the approaches and so forth to the base in terms of anti-aircraft fire or that, that sort of thing? Yeah, um, a lot of the um, advisories that we had to give and vectoring that we gave um, dealt a lot with artillery. Uh, we had an artillery company right behind our barracks that mm -hmm. shot out almost straight out the approach end of the runway mm -hmm. and we had them all around the base camp. When they were firing or artillery from other areas going over us, mm -hmm. Um, it was up to us to keep the aircraft out of those firing lanes um, so that they weren't in danger of being hit. Um, another one, too, would be um, approaches if we knew there was anyone out there. Quite often the approaches would change to a very high approach mm -hmm. and then almost dive at the airfield um, as they came into land. Uh, so anyone out there, would that be the Viet Cong or somebody like that who might yep. have a... Uh, did they have things like shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles and that sort of equipment? or They didn't have that at, at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, there was nothing in the shoulder-fired. Once they got low enough, and, and I had a couple friends that were actually um, severely injured, and of course mm -hmm. we had a number killed by small arms fire, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of what the um, helicopters did was low level. Right. I used to do flying on my days off just because there wasn't much else to do, mm -hmm. so I'd um, go over to one of the companies, since we knew a lot of the pilots, mm -hmm. um, just give their gunner or their crew chief the day off and to fly and, and you got used to treetop level mm -hmm. and um, if you got into an open area and they could see you coming you yeah. were a pretty open target, pretty target yeah. and uh, some of the missions I went on were the low-level sniffer missions which they actually had a, a thing in the aircraft that sensed residual heat mm -hmm. in a collector it almost looked like the yeah. end of a vacuum cleaner yeah. hanging out the side of the aircraft and that had to be low level so you were down where you were very susceptible to small arms um, did you uh, have much occasion to get off the base or did you basically stay there through your tour I tried to get off as much as I could um, simply like I say after you've been there for a while <laughs> you've mm -hmm. kind of seen it all and done it all um, so I would go flying um, on my days off. I mm -hmm. did a couple of road trips, one up uh, to Tain mm -hmm. um, which which was a very beautiful and interesting area. Um, 
went one time with a, a chaplain up there and, and we went down this road and uh, suddenly he stopped, said get out, but keep your weapons with you. And he pointed up to a line of trees maybe a hundred yards mm -hmm. away from us and said, that's Cambodia. <laughs> and the first words out of my mouth were, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I mean, we were alone. <laughs> it was way out there. I did get it down to the Saigon area mm -hmm. on occasion. Um, Saigon City itself was off limits a mm -hmm. lot during the time I was there simply because so many soldiers were getting in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. But I was able to overfly it on numerous occasions and, and get a lot of pictures and, and things of, of the area. So got to know it a little bit. What did they do to keep uh, soldiers and people occupied or entertained at that point if they're not so, sending them into Saigon? <laughs> not much. Um, we did have movies. We had kind of a a club mm -hmm. um, in our company area and uh, you know unfortunately one of the the uh, favorite pastimes was to drink when you were off because there mm -hmm. wasn't much else to do we did get movies in there um, on occasion we we got shows such as they mm -hmm. were a lot of them uh, more Korean rock groups um, <laughs> that, that came through uh, some of them were pretty good some of them not um, in December of um, 1970 um, they had actually this was during the time when we were uh, taking a lot of the troops out mm -hmm. of Vietnam. The 25th Infantry Division had left mm -hmm. and Coo Chi was closed. I was transferred for just a few weeks down to Benoit, um, to Tonson Air Force Base. Uh, I joked about it a little bit because being there was kind of like being back in civilization mm -hmm. again. But then they wanted to reopen the airfield at Coo Chi. So mm -hmm. myself and another fellow that had been a controller were sent out there to train new troops and mm -hmm. uh, reopen the airfield. On uh, Christmas Day of 1970, we sent all the new guys down to Saigon to see the Bob Hope Show. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we set up the tower and got everything working, and um, we were both short. We, we only each had about two months left and figured, mm -hmm. you know, they deserve it. <laughs> They've got a year left, mm -hmm. and uh, we stayed behind and did that while they got to go down and, and spend Christmas Day down there. Once in a while, you know, Thanksgiving, generally they did a, a big turkey dinner. I mean, tried to mm -hmm. make the meal as special as they could. Although it was unique because I think Vietnam is the only place I've ever been where the cooks could take bread hot out of the oven and it was already stale. So when they <laughs> called the, the meal special, you know, that was kind of a relative thing. Um, Christmas, generally they tried to do something special. Um, you know, so there were things that they tried to do to make it a little mm -hmm. better didn't much matter. You still had to work and uh, and do the job because for the most part it was just another day. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned uh, some Vietnamese sort of in infiltrating into the base and so forth. What were you aware of or what kind of stuff was going on and like that? Well, um, on several occasions um, we caught some of the Mama Sons who were our hooch maids um, pacing off distances between buildings or between buildings in the wire. Um, there were several occasions where the Papa Sons that were barbers during the day mm -hmm. uh, were back at night with the same razors and they actually went into some company areas and tried to slit throats and, and do damage like that. So uh, there were things that went on. We never had any frontal attacks mm -hmm. like they used mm -hmm. to. I mean, we never had any mass attacks. Uh, but of course, mortars. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's an impersonal thing. I mean, that's just lobbing something in there and hoping for the best. Right. Uh, but most of it was just those little irritating things that, that you know, it caused minor damage, but it mm -hmm. still always made you wonder. Yeah. Uh, what sort of Vietnamese presence was there actually on the base during the day? There was quite a bit, actually. Um, a lot of uh, the workers, um, the Papa Sons, um, that were handling the barber issues and the mm -hmm. human waste issues and things, we did have a, a lot of uh, hooch maids that were actually in charge of keeping our hooches clean, doing laundry, things of that nature. They worked in our kitchens and the various maintenance mm -hmm. uh, issues around the camp. So there's actually quite a strong Vietnamese presence on the base camp. Okay. Uh, did you have any contact with the South Vietnamese Army or Air Force people at all? Um, yes, we did. Um, we had some South Vietnamese Army troops uh, based at the camp. And, of course, as controllers, we did work with the VNAF. Mm -hmm. And that was always a thrill because although they kind of spoke English and you mm -hmm. could almost understand them, um, I think most of the time they didn't understand. So when they were coming into the airfield, they kind of did whatever was expedient, no matter mm -hmm. what you told mm -hmm. them to do. <laughs> and so I had several occasions where I had an aircraft 
military coming in from this side and a VNAV all of a sudden decides he's going to come in from the other way mm -hmm. and they're landing head on or, or taking off into one coming in. Uh, so it made for some real interesting times <laughs> working with them. Uh, when we went back and opened uh, Coochie in uh, December of 70, we had a company of 01 U.S. pilots there, but everybody else we worked with was uh, VNAF. Mm -hmm. What sense did you have at that point for sort of the morale or the attitude of the Vietnamese troops that you were dealing with? At that point, it seemed to be good. Mm -hmm. um, you, you get into a funny area here because I guess I've always felt and I knew and I recently just saw a really neat t-shirt. I've got to get one of it. It shows the Vietnam Service Medal and says when I left we were winning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true all the way up to 1972 when the last troops pulled out. And mm -hmm. at that point in time, uh, by, by late 70, even when the Americans were pulling out, things were going well. Mm -hmm. um, because of our support, the South Vietnamese Army was doing pretty well. They were coming on strong, and I think the Easter Offensive, even in uh, 73, I believe it was, when we gave air support to the South Vietnamese Army, they did okay. Mm -hmm. well, 72, then, but yeah. Uh, 72, yeah. yes, okay. And um, at that point, they, I think they felt good about themselves. I think we felt fairly good about them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think they were capable of doing the job. They did not have enough stuff mm -hmm. to do the job. And, of course, I think that was our promise to them. We'll provide right. the stuff. You take over the, the mm -hmm. business at hand. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I felt they were capable in a lot of ways. Uh, I'd have maybe liked to have some Vietnamese controllers with us to kind of deal with some mm -hmm. of the issues. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have that luxury. Um, and so we just dealt with them ourselves as best we could. But I think overall in working with them, they seemed committed mm -hmm. um, to what they were doing. Uh, they seemed to be fairly well trained, and uh, I felt we're doing a good job. Did you wonder all about what motivated the people who were sneaking around on the base at night and making trouble for you? <sighs> no, I, I don't think I wondered about it. Um, the things I think most of the troops seem to wonder about, and I, I don't know that the questions were answered sufficiently mm -hmm. for me until mm -hmm. within the last few years, being able to look back at hindsight, read mm -hmm. the writings of some of the people involved. Our questions were, why exactly are we here? Yeah. Um, and what difference is it going to make to these people? I mean, mm -hmm. as you traveled around Vietnam and you see these little farming villages mm -hmm. and, and rice paddies and, and very little civilization as we would consider mm -hmm. it, the question was, what difference is anything ever going to make? Mm -hmm. Well, I think after it fell, we realized it, it made a big difference, um, and still is today. Um, the reasons we were there um, at that point, as I say, I don't think were sufficiently explained mm -hmm. uh, for us to ever answer that question while we were there. Mm -hmm. We were there to do a job. Yeah. We did the job. I think we did it honorably. Mm -hmm. um, that was my feeling the whole time, at least the people I worked with and the vets I know. Mm -hmm. um, but we never really understood why. Um, I think today I understand that basically it boiled down to we drew a line in the sand and said mm -hmm. you're not expanding any farther. But I don't think that was ever really sufficiently explained to the soldiers or the country at large at that point in time to understand why. Yeah. Uh, how long was your tour? My tour uh, ended up 11 and a half months. Um, it was supposed to be a year, mm -hmm. but again, with the drawdown at that point, they were giving mm -hmm. people a two-week early come home, yeah. which was a nice gift uh, at the end of the tour. Your short-timer calendar all of a sudden got a little shorter. Okay. Um, that was nice. And you were in for a, a three-year hitch at that point. Yes, so, I was. So how much time did you have left on that? I had uh, about a year and a half left after mm -hmm. that. So when I returned to the States, I had a 30-day leave. Then I was assigned to Fritchie Army Airfield out at Fort Ord, California. Mm -hmm. And what were you doing there? Same thing. Um, I was a GCA controller, and then I cross-trained up to the tower there um, when I got done. Um, whole different deal there. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of the nice thing is we were only a short distance from the Navy base at Salinas, mm -hmm. and they did not have a GCA facility. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of the Navy aircraft coming over to train with us. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it was really, really slow compared to, to Vietnam. Um, at that point, actually, I, I began taking my own flying lessons at a little club there at the airport. Mm -hmm. And so I would go out a lot of times when we were having a hard time making the numbers we needed to stay current. <laughs> and I would fly GCA approaches for the other controllers uh, to help them stay current, um, which was enjoyable for me. gave me a few hours and uh, gives you a different perspective on the other side of the process. Yeah. What was Fort Ord like at that time? 
Fort Ord was still a training facility, um, and that was unique in that I got tapped once to go do um, PT tests uh, for the new recruits. Um, before we could do that, we had to take a four-hour class in how you now train uh, or how you relate to the troops. Okay, so you were doing the... Transition. We were doing the PT test, yeah, by that time they had transitioned to the volunteer army. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of things that had been done to us in mm -hmm. basic training that were no longer allowed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, calling them names of certain types mm -hmm. and yelling and screaming and a lot of the things. So we actually were trained in what we could and could not do mm -hmm. while we were grading the PT <laughs> tests. Uh, went out and did that. Um, Fort Ord also had a couple of uh, infantry companies and a rather large MP presence there. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, very big base. Of course, now it's been closed down mm -hmm. uh, completely. Um, so when I was there, it was quite different. Okay. And what options did you have for entertainment there? Well, um, of course, we made some trips up to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. That was a fairly short drive, and uh, you had a lot of the great scenic places, Carmel, Big Sur, 17-mile mm -hmm. drive and things right in the local area. On the camp, not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, and the 